All right, well, hey, happy Thanksgiving weekend. I hope you've had a great, great week. And yes, I know I'm up here on, on the screen. I have a message here today that I want our entire church family to hear. Okay, so just roll with me here. The truth of God coming to you. We're going to open the scriptures here in a moment. And God's going to speak by the power of his spirit. So I'm so glad that you're here today, especially our guests, some of you from out of town. How many of y'all ate way too much? This is for you. You can see each other. How many ate too much? Mass confession this past week. All right, how many of you um, had family in town? We had family in our, our home and we had an awesome time, extended family. My mom here uh, with us, it's just been awesome. How many of you have family still here? They are still here. Um, don't, you don't have to raise your hand how many you want them to No, we're all good so everybody's had a great time and I trust that it's been an awesome awesome week we have had a great week here way to go church family in this room we uh, on, on Thursday morning we were caring for lots of folks across uh, our community particularly in Vickery uh, really helping provide for those who uh, who are in need we have meals for kids that are actually wouldn't have meals uh, to eat uh, because they're out of school and we, we've been providing uh, meals for kids and also down at Cornerstone um, with, uh, with people in the community putting meals together in the kitchen there at Cornerstone Church with Chris Simmons and the crew and it has been awesome. So way to go church. So proud of you. I know that uh, we seek to be a church that loves and uh, gives and shares with others who don't perhaps have as much and all so we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ the love of Christ with people in our city and beyond. So way to go, church. I'm so proud of you. I want to ask a question. How many of you, and this could be a tender question, frankly, how many of you have ever been, um, been promised something uh, by someone and it did not come true or they did not come through for you? Now, you don't have to raise your hand on that one because that can get really tender. I mean, when you think about someone you love who promises something and then they don't come through for you, Maybe we all as parents, if you're a parent, you've promised a child something and oops, forgot to do that, didn't show. Um, or maybe, maybe a child, uh, maybe a young uh, adult or maybe with a friend. Maybe you have been promised something from a friend and it didn't come through. I think the worst probably would be the promise of a spouse that is broken. Um, those are heartbreaking things to walk through. But maybe the most devastating, heartbreaking promises uh, that don't come to fruition are the ones we make uh, to ourselves. If I could only do this, if I could get to this place in my life or have this or this. And the pursuit of a false promise, a promise that's not going to come through for you, uh, can be devastating. It can even lead to a wasted life. And this is what Jesus is going to teach us. He's going to tell us a story in the Bible. And I want to tell the story here uh, to begin. We'll get to the text in a moment, but I want to tell the story uh, as if Jesus were telling the story today. So uh, it's a story of a man who was in the agribusiness. Uh, this man was a hardworking man. And, and in fact, he was willing to give whatever it would take and it would take everything. He, um, by the time he was 30, he owned his own company. Uh, he was very successful in a loving marriage. He had a couple of kids and he was vaguely aware that his 10 to 12 uh, hours a day working was really keeping him away from his kids. He was vaguely aware they were growing up rather quickly without him at home. And his wife would periodically remind him that they were at a critical time in the life of their kids and he, he needed to be home. So they talked through that and worked through it. And he'd often say, hey, honey, listen, listen, things are going so well. Uh, we've got one more project, you know, that's coming. And, and after that, he said, when things settle down, that was kind of his favorite phrase. When things settle down, uh, we're going to be we're going to be set. Now, they would go back and forth. She, of course, understood the stress of his job and how hard it was for him to work. And she was grateful that she got to kind of stay home with the kids, I guess. And and so uh, she would encourage him and he, she would call him back. And he at times would get better. But ultimately, he'd drift back into his patterns of being gone way too much. And he was so engulfed with his work, in fact, that when he found himself at home, uh, he he was not at work, but he would be thinking about work. So his occupation became a preoccupation and it was constantly on his mind. He often would work late 
at home. He'd bring work home and and, and at times he, he couldn't get off of his phone or he was on email or whatever else. And, and after the kids uh, would ask him over and over again to, to read books or to play catch after enough books not read and enough games of catch not played, uh, they stopped asking because they stopped expecting. And then one day, under a lot of stress over the course of several weeks, he felt a twinge in his chest and he was finally uh, convinced by his wife to go to the doctor. And sure enough, the doctor said he had kind of a slight heart attack. And so he put him on medication and said, man, you've got to change your diet. In fact, you kind of have to change the pattern of your life. You need to get into the gym. You got to get healthier. You need a better rhythm of life. So he did that for a while. That lasted for a little while until the comptroller of his company came to him and said, you will not believe this. Our business is booming. Uh, he, he said that demand is outstripping supply. Uh, our software is outdated. We've got inventory uh, headaches like you wouldn't believe. But he said, if we catch this wave, if we make all the changes now, if we overhaul this company, we're going to be set for life. So this guy went home from that meeting and he told his wife all about it. And she was initially really, really excited for him. And they realized over the next couple of decades, if they played it right, he could retire early. And sure enough, when things settled down, they would have the life that they'd always dreamed of. Well, she said, you know, we're in this together, uh, so we're going to make it. So let's let's press on. And he would go on and work now like a man possessed. He walked the company through really a technological revolution, 24 seven access to the to the company's uh, products, a delivery system that was unmatched by any other company in, in, uh, in his business. And uh, then one night, uh, he was home working like he often would. His wife had gone to bed, and about 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, she woke up, and she realized he wasn't in bed. And she went downstairs, and sure enough, he's sitting at the kitchen table, and uh, he's just kind of slumped over his work. And she thought to herself, look at him. He's like a kid. I've got to help him, uh, you know, get to bed and tuck him in. And so she went over and shook, uh, shook his shoulder. And she immediately gasped because she knew something was wrong. She called 911. The paramedics came and uh, they tried to revive him. And they told her, sure enough, he'd had a massive heart attack and He'd been dead for a couple of hours. And so uh, his death made big news in the financial community. His obituary was written up in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it was written up in Forbes magazine. The news was out and everybody was shocked that this young entrepreneur, uh, straight arrow guy, just a wonderful man, had died. So they had this great... Uh, funeral service for him, a memorial. Uh, they all went out to the graveside and all the people gathered around. And at his funeral service, they, they talked about what a great guy he was. They said, man, this guy was an entrepreneur. He was a, a visionary leader. Uh, he was a, a faithful husband. He was a provider for his family. Uh, he, was, he was a genius in, in, in his particular uh, area of, of work and business. And they used words to describe him like um, visionary and uh, networker and hardworking guy. And then after the service was over, they all left, went back to their homes and back to their lives. And then that night, the angel of God came and visited his tombstone his gravesite, and with a finger etched on the tombstone, the one word that God chose to describe this man. Fool, he wrote. Fool. What other word God would say to us would you use to describe a man who would cover every possible contingency in life, cover every possibility except the one 
possibility that comes to every single person who's ever been born. Death itself. What other word would you use to describe someone who's so busy building his own kingdom that he has no time for the kingdom of God? What kind of rationale is this? With all of this man's entrepreneurial and, 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 and uh, financial acumen, of all of his abilities to run cross-benefit analyses and, and cash flow projections, this guy forgot to prepare for the one certainty that every single one of us living will face in this life. Death itself and eternity after death. What other word would you use to describe a person who lives that way? God calls him a fool. Jesus is showing us here that it's possible to be owned by a false promise that someday when things settle down, I'm going to have everything that I need. And it led him to a wasted life. Now, Jesus tells the story in Luke chapter 12. I want you to grab your Bible there. It's in Luke 12, and we're going to look to see how Jesus told this story. And um, then I want to make some applications before we uh, close our time on this uh, Thanksgiving weekend. I want to talk about one life owned by the promise of God. Let's talk about not a false promise, but being owned by the promise, I could say the promises of God. Luke chapter 12, verse 16 through 21. You can see it there. Uh, and I want to talk about this one and only life. So here's how Jesus tells the story. And by the way, this story is set up in Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Um, it's set up with a domestic squabble argument over, in, over inheritance. Now today, there'd be attorneys involved and it gets ugly, really nasty if it's dealing with a family, which was the case here, uh, two brothers who are fighting over inheritance, and they come to the rabbi, which wasn't too uncommon. Uh, he would be the legal uh, master, the teacher, who would understand how to guide these two. So uh, they come to him in verse 13 of, of Luke chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to him, Hey, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Okay, the desire to have something that doesn't belong to you is what this word literally means. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. In verse 20, but God said to him, fool. This night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to talk about this one and only life that you've been given. This is the message that I have, I should say, that, that the Lord has for our entire church family on this Thanksgiving weekend. It's a good time to think about this one and only life that you've been given. Now, first of all, this one and only life is a gift from God. Look at verse 16. I want you to catch this. Um, it says that, that the that the, the land produced, look at this, notice the ground produced a good crop. Now the, you may just pass over this, but here's the thing. This, this guy was blessed by God. God is the one who brought to him all that he has. God's the one who gave him the good crop. God gave him the ability to be successful in the first place. You know, I've noticed this past week uh, that, you know, Thanksgiving itself is a theist holiday. Think about it. Uh, if you're an atheist, if you don't believe in God, then who are you thanking this week? Who have you been thanking? I guess we could thank each other. 
I guess we can thank family. Thank you. Thank you for this turkey. Thank you for all this food. Thank you, children, for being born into our family. I mean, you know, it's a it's a it's Thanksgiving. And here's the thing about us as believers. We know who to thank. We know whom to thank. Christ, the Lord, has given us all that we have. And we acknowledge this. This man didn't acknowledge that he'd been blessed by God. The man in my story, he didn't understand that all that he had and was given was from God. And he just desired more and more. So this one and only life is a gift from God. And so our lives as believers, we should understand that more than anyone. And it should be one big hallelujah back to God. All of life is a life of thanksgiving. You could call it thanks living. The one and only life is a gift from God. This one and only life can be lived for oneself or for God. Look at verse 17 through 18. Notice he says, what shall I do? Uh, I'll do this. My, myself. Eleven times he uses the word I or my or me in just two verses. Eleven times. This is what I'm going to do. But here's the thing. You can't live for both. We've talked about that in this series. You can't live for God. You can't serve God in mammon. You can't serve God. You can't worship God and worship, run after the things of this world. You must settle this question. For whom are you living? Are you living for God or do you live for yourself? No one can serve two masters, Jesus says. You know, James chapter 4, verse 13 references this kind of a story where James says, hey, for those of you who want to say this, like, hey, we're going to go to this, this city and do this. We're going to buy this and we're going to make profit here. He says, hey, hey, listen, no, 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 no. Your life is a vapor. It's like a puff of smoke. It is here and it is gone. He says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, I'm going to do this or that. And he's saying, if you're pursuing God, you're going to seek his will, not your own. If the Lord desires for us to do this as we pursue him and follow him, he's going to lead us to this or to that. You've got to decide, are you living your life in thanksgiving to God? Or are you living for yourself? Well, this one and only life, not only is it a gift from God, it can be lived for oneself or for God. It's a journey. It's not a destination. Now, here's what I mean. Now, I don't don't get me wrong. There's a destination. The Bible's very clear. We could talk about those of us who receive Christ and you've received forgiveness from God, that we spend eternity with God. But apart from God, we spend eternity in hell apart from him. There's coming a day. There's an eternal moment when we leave this life. And we're going to be faced with eternity. And those who've trusted Christ and have been forgiven and not have trusted in themselves to be good enough and to work hard enough, those of us who've received Christ, we find ourselves in heaven. There is a destination, if you will. But my point is this. The destination is Christ himself. The journey is always to Christ himself. But look at this man. He believed the false promise of retirement, you could say. Take it easy, it says. Relax is really the translation in verse 19. Hey, relax, eat, drink, and be merry. You have arrived. Listen, wealth is not a destination. Wealth is actually, listen to this, in, in Christ, wealth is a, an identity. Wealth, a, a true wealth, true riches is not found in, in, in some destination we finally arrive. I mean, I could point out so many stories of those and you know them yourself. We know so many stories of people who are so ultimately wealthy, but they find themselves um, no, no happier. In fact, uh, less happy than they ever were before. And it's because we think that in those things we're going to find true joy and happiness. Wealth is not a destination. Wealth is an identity. And here's what I mean. Only when we come to Christ. Do we receive his riches for our poverty, his righteousness for our sin? And in him, we finally find wealth, true wealth and happiness and success, peace and joy in this life. It's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, it says this. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that... You, look at this, by his poverty might become rich. We become rich in him. See, wealth, ultimate uh, wealth, being rich in God is not a destination. It's not, it's not some fine, you know, f- final uh, income. 
It's not a, a certain salary. It's not an amount. Ultimate worth and value, ultimate rich, richness and wealth is found in Christ and Him alone. So, this one and only life, it, it's, it's a journey. It's not a destination. And the journey is always to Christ. I want you to see here, thirdly, this, this, this one and only life will come to an end. Fourthly, will come to an end. Verse 20, you fool, this very night, you cannot escape eternity. Let me ask you, are you living in light of eternity? Are you living with the end in sight? You know, if, if I were to, to tell you that, um, let's just imagine for a moment, let's do this. Let, imagine that there's a line that runs all the way across, like right, right here horizontally uh, from, from finger to finger. But let's say that, uh, that it starts right here. Okay, my life begins here and then a line that goes into eternity. Just pretend there's a line that goes forever. All right. My life in eternity. OK, I can't even show you how small it would be. And I know you're going to have trouble seeing this. But let's say this is my life right here. And then there's a line of eternity that goes this way. I was born here and, and now I'm I'm right about midway through here, maybe a little beyond that. And I'm working hard to this little part right here. The part right toward the end of my life, I'm going to finally retire. Man, Stacy and I will be retired, be loving it with grandkids. I'm working hard towards that portion of my life. And then, bam, I die. And let's, let's say I retire at 65, 70. Let's go, I got another 10 years, 15 years right there. I'm working for that. And then I die. And then I have millions and billions of years to follow. The second after you die, Everything in life changes and everything makes sense, if you will. You'll see life for what it was. You'll be before God Almighty. And what Jesus is telling us here is that every life will come to an end and all that will matter in the end is whether you invested in the things of eternity and not in the things of this world. It's just a vapor, James says. It's just a moment in time. And we have one chance, one moment to make this life count. And I'm calling you, Jesus is calling us to live with the end in sight. So the last thing I want to say is this. This one and only life, not only will it come to an end, this one and only life should be invested in God's riches. That's what Jesus says here. He says that you would be rich towards God. Look at the moral of the story is verse, uh, verse 20, where he says, So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Just like this guy. He might be wealthy in the world, but he's not rich towards God. So it begs the question, how do we be, how do we become, how can we be rich or invest in God's riches? Well, first is to receive Christ. If you've never uh, asked Christ to, to forgive you of your sin, you've received his grace. He died on the cross for you. That's what Paul is referencing earlier in, in 2 Corinthians 8. He became poor. God became a man in Christ. He, he suffered and died on the cross to take upon himself the punishment for our sin that should have been ours. He took on our shame and he died on the cross and then he was buried. He died a death for us so that we wouldn't have to die, that we could live for eternity with him. So he died. He was raised again so that we too would be raised up to follow him. So that this little section, this little portion of life uh, in all of eternity, we are then able to live with him and worship him and, yes, have much to do. I could say this. If you're thinking, hey, when will things settle down? Uh, someone could say, well, I tell you when things settle down. Uh, when you die, that things settle way down. Right. When you die. You... No, no, no. Listen, when, when we die, we've only just begun to live. But it's true. All the stuff of this world, we're always seeking more. Things will never settle down. So how do you live in a way that, 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 that allows us to focus on the riches of God? Well, I, I would say it this way, to worship Him with your life. Again, it's thanks living, praising Him for all He's done. And then it's also to, to worship Him in the context of His family. Be in accountable relationships. Some of you need today to join the fellowship of the church because it's here that we find loving relationships that point us to this kind of life where we don't get off track. 
and we learn the word of God and we're holding one another accountable. We worship, we connect in our groups together. We do life together. We serve others because that gets us outside of ourselves and helps us to hold loosely to the things that he's given us. And we multiply our lives, bringing the gospel to others and helping others learn what it is to follow him. There's a rare uh, prayer uh, in the Bible, or I should say little known prayer that many people have never seen. It's in Proverbs chapter 30. And I'm going to close with this because I find it interesting. When we think about investing in God's riches, it's Proverbs 30, verse 7 uh, through 9. And here's what it says. It's called the prayer of, of Agur, by the way. It has a name. This guy writes this proverb and in it is this prayer. Here's Agur's prayer. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. He's saying, Lord, give me these two things before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. How about that? Don't, I could say it in, in our context today, don't let me chase after a false promise. Don't let me believe a lie. Keep that from me. Then the second thing he says is this, give me neither poverty nor riches. Don't let me be poor, but don't let me be wealthy. Not, not, not way big time rich. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. He said, just give me what I need lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of God. He's saying, I don't want too little, but I don't want too much. Because if I have too much, I'm going to focus my heart and my soul there and I will forget you. And I'll say, who is God? You see, here's the thing. We talked about this last week, that 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 really wealth has this crazy dizzying effect on us. It desensitizes us. It makes us delusional. It makes us think that by the things we have that we're okay or a little bit more, we're going to be okay. We're going to be all right. It makes us delusional. It desensitizes us to the true needs of our lives. I, I, I read this week, um, somebody figured this out by one count. There are 3,573 promises in the Bible. I don't know who came up with that, but let's say they're close to it. 3,500 promises in the Bible. But what does it mean to, to, to be owned then, not by a false promise, but by the promise of God? What does that mean? Well, I'd say this. The promise of God, listen, the promise of God has a name. His name is Jesus. Listen to what it says. I love this verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20. And we'll end with this challenge. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. All of the promises, all 3,500, I mean, million promises of God that have come to us find their yes in Him, in Christ. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. So is there forgiveness to come? Can I find forgiveness? Yes and amen in Christ. Can I really find peace in this life? I'm, I'm running this race that Christ described, this story you've told today. That's me. That's me. Is there really peace to be found? Yes and amen in Christ. Give your life to him. Is, is there really a, a way that I can live apart from anxiety and dis-ease and worry? Yes and amen. It's found in Him. It's in Christ. All of the promises of God are found in Him. That's why I say give your life not to the false promise of stuff of this world, but instead give your life to the eternal things of God. And you do so by embracing the promise of God that is found in Christ and in Him alone. Let's pray together as we close and commit our lives to Him now. Lord, we see that You have shown us that the pursuit of more will never be enough. We know that the stuff of this world tends to capture us and we have seen the dizzying effects of the pursuit of more. So Lord, teach us, remind us again today that more will never be enough Things will never settle down. And we need to commit our lives to you 
So we embrace the promise that is Christ, our Lord, who has died on the cross for our sin. We give you our lives anew today. And friend, if you're here today with your head bowed and eyes closed, you can receive Christ right now. Say yes and amen to Him. Yes, Lord, I believe. You died on the cross for my sin. I give up. I'm sorry that I've been trying to fulfill my own dreams in my own way, to have my own bigger barns and more stuff. I give you my life so that when that day comes, when my soul is required, I'll be ready to face you. Lord, help us not to waste our lives. We give you our lives anew even now. We thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.